Um, and so uh, I'm going to introduce our speaker for this evening. Um, Bob Pop is uh, the botanist for the Vermont Fish and uh, Wildlife Department. He's been that for 25 years or more, uh, which is part of the Natural Heritage Inventory. Um, so he keeps track of the status and distribution of all uh, rare, threatened, and endangered plants in the state of Vermont. Um, he works out of the Barry District Office, and he lives in uh, Marshfield. Um, in terms of Bob's background, uh, he received his undergraduate degree from uh, SUNY ESF um, at Syracuse. Um, and he did his graduate work at Colorado State and the University of Massachusetts. Um, and his graduate research was focused primarily on alpine plants. Uh, prior to landing in his current position um, here in Vermont, um, he spent time in Africa working in the deserts of northern Kenya um, and also mapping uh, wetlands for the National Wetlands Inventory Project here in the United States. Um, in his spare time, he is an avid runner, birder, Nordic skier, hiker, um, and dabbles with the piano. So very well-rounded uh, botanist. Um, and he and his wife uh, recently completed, completed hiking all of the 4,000-foot peaks in New England. Um, and are now focusing on the New York High Peaks. And so we're, we're very excited to have Bob um, come speak to us tonight and, and provide a sort of statewide context to what uh, many of you got a glimpse of today in terms of the very you know, sort of special features and diversity of the Vermont flora you know, within driving distance of this location. Um, and Bob's going to put some of that into sort of a statewide context in terms of rare, threatened, and endangered plant species in Vermont contributions to the diversity of New England. Okay. Thanks, Jesse. just informed me that it was, it's been 29 years since I've had this position. I, I stopped counting, but apparently he hasn't, so. <laughs> oh, okay. do, we, do we want to leave the lights on or turn them on? There we go. So the, the talk tonight is Vermont's contribution to New England's rare flora, and I'm going to focus on uh, the rare, the taxa that are uh, rare throughout New England, but only occur in Vermont or occur very sparsely elsewhere, or the only um, um, extant populations are in Vermont. And, and just as uh, an aside, uh, Cryptogamma stellari didn't even make the list because even though it's it's rare throughout New England, uh, it, it's, it, Vermont's not the only population, so that's the focus is going to be more on, that, on the, uh, the ones that only occur here. Uh, just starting off quickly, uh, we roughly divide Vermont into eight biophysical regions, and we're going to be focusing primarily on the Champlain Valley and the Taconics, and also the Vermont Valley. And the reason for that is, uh, you know, that's, that's where a lot of more Western or Midwestern species get into the state. And it's also because of the preponderance of um, calcareous ridge bedrock. There's a lot of limestone there. Um, that said, I'm, I'm going to uh, make a number of exceptions that you'll see, and we'll be talking about some of the species that occur in the, in the Green Mountains and, and elsewhere in the state. But that's, that's the main reason. Um, New York has, excuse me, Vermont has uh, so many species that are, uh, that occur only in Vermont and New England is because of the, the limey uh, Champlain Valley and the proximity to, to New York just across the lake. Um, so this is the uh, important feature that I was talking about is the bedrock geology. And the, the thing you want to focus on is first of all the light blue and you see the preponderance of the light blue in the Champlain Valley. And that's the, the real carbonate-rich bedrocks, the, the limestones and the dolomites, et cetera. And it's, it runs pretty much from the Canadian border um, all the way down to, like, that's Whitehall, New York, the, uh, uh, New Haven, uh, excuse me, West Haven, uh, Vermont, that kind of sticks down into to Whitehall, New York. It's the part of Vermont that's really sticking into New York. Uh, I think your finger is in the way. 
Ah, thank you. Uh -oh. All right. We're on top of it now. Uh, you'll notice the taconics, which is right here, doesn't show up as primarily carbonate, but there, there is some, um, it's locally calcareous. And then the blue here is the Vermont Valley, which is uh, between the, the taconics and the escarpment on uh, the Green Mountains. And if you've driven up Route 7 from like Bennington up to Rutland, you've driven along the Vermont Valley, and it's really uh, rich in, in, in floral and uh, all the limestone. Uh, the other interesting part, uh, bedrock, is uh, not so much the copper-colored ones, but the yellow, of this yellowish green, and that's the ultramafic, uh, and the, uh, the serpentine, essentially. And you can't really see it too well here, but there's a little outcrop down there in Dover, and there's some here in like Cavendish, Proctorville, uh, and there's a little piece in Roxbury, and then the bulk of it is up in uh, Westfield and Lowell, and that's where the real uh, serpentine endemics occur, and we're going to talk about some of them too, even though they're not in the, in the Champlain Valley. They said it would make a few exceptions. So the, uh, the Champlain Valley, as, as I said, is underlain with limestones and, and quartzites and uh, medicine, sedimentary rocks, um, but they're overlain by lake and marine clays and sands. So that's where we have our um, our sand plain communities, our um, clay plain forest communities, uh, in addition to the um, a lot of calcareous cliffs and, and, uh, and that. Uh, moving on to the taconics, again, there's some marbles and limestones. It's primarily not carbonate, but it, it is locally carbonate. So you, you do find some really rich areas if, if you know where to look. Um, that's mostly oaks and, and northern hardwoods. Um, there's a little more relief there than in the uh, Champlain Valley, so you get uh, spruce and fir at the higher elevations. And then the Vermont Valley uh, is real, um, that's where the dolomites and the limestone grow. There's actual karst features in places, and um, there's, there's lots of uh, swamps and seeps, so that's where some of our most extensive rich fens are. Um, Red, uh, red maple, tamarack uh, forests, and, and just all the things that are dependent on calcareous rich uh, seepage. So I'm going to talk a little bit, you'll see in the next table, um, I have different um, rarity ranks, and I'm going to have um, what's called the uh, NALCC, the North Atlantic uh, Conservation um, Cooperative, uh, and it's, it's the the rarity in that region whoops, that you see, that's all green. So it's essentially all of New England, um, Quebec's uh, south of the St. Lawrence, um, Nova Scotia, PEI, and then a, uh, most of New York to the uh, west, uh, east of the Hudson River, um, but extending into the Adirondacks and Tug Hill Plateau, and then the sliver going down the coast all the way, um, it's all of, all of Delaware, and chunk of Maryland and, and, and Virginia. So it's a pretty sizable um, chunk, of, chunk of the country. So this is the list I came up with. And um, it, was, it was kind of quick and dirty. I came up with 46 taxa. And um, you know, as, as I said, the, the, the began didn't even didn't make it because um, it, it occurs in so many other states. So the ones that are uh, bolded, and there should be about 29 of those, are ones that, the, as far as I can tell, the only extant occurrences are in Vermont. And then there's like another 19 uh, that, uh, also, that, are, uh, that are very rare um, outside of Vermont. They, well, they are everywhere, but there, there may be like one, one population that's not in Vermont. Uh, two things I want to point out on this list, which uh, you can probably see, or maybe you can't because it's too small, but um, You'll notice the preponderance, the, the, the abundance of batrachiums, mm -hmm. and um, I'm not quite sure to, that, to attribute that to. Is it something? You know, is it something in the water? Uh, is it, you know, <laughs> is it the bedrock, or is it you know having so many batrachium uh, uh, experts here? Among them, you know, Art Gilman, who you know, finds these things. We, we have another person who's, uh, who's found a number of these. So, um, yeah, I don't know. 
hard to say. The other thing that you'll notice is the total absence, and I, I, I think most of you will thank me for this, the total absence of Cretavis. Uh, I, just decided, <laughs> I just decided not to go there. There's just, there's just too much taxonomic uncertainty, too much uh, status uncertainty. Uh, I think Art was telling me at dinner that he, he just found us, us we found a species of Critigus in Vermont that hadn't been seen in, I think it was, it was close to 100 years. Uh, but you know, who knows if these, where these, if these occur throughout New England or, uh, but we do have reason to believe that Vermont is a hotbed for parthons. Um, and you know, if anyone wants to go there, it's, it's a, <laughs> a good, it, it could use a lot of work. And uh, I decided not to go there with this talk because uh, you'd all be falling asleep, I think, with critique and that Critigus. So, moving on to the species, uh, I've taken this alphabetically, so it's no, uh, no intention of like importance or anything, but this is the uh, Champlain beach grass, which has been described as a separate subspecies, not, not recognized by everybody, I'll admit. Uh, it occurs in uh, two places in Vermont, a, I think a couple of places, uh, maybe equal in number, two across the lake in, in uh, New York and Plattsburgh, and then it occurs, um, I guess, on the south shore of Lake Ontario. And then as you move out it, and, up, and up and down the St. Lawrence River, it becomes a little more nebulous. Like it, it, it's, so it's something of a gradient. But the one, what we have here, we also have the planted, um, just Brevilligulata, the subspecies Brevilligulata. And phenologically, they're really different. The um, Champlainensis flowers, a couple of weeks to maybe a month earlier, and it senesces a lot earlier. So the best time to distinguish them is you go out in the fall, and the, uh, the coastal beach grass would be you know, bright and green and just standing up there, and the river ligulated will all be brown and senescent, and kind mm. of just ready, you know, it's like we're done for the year. Uh, and, and there's also a, a size difference. The, uh, the stature is smaller. Uh, we actually have a site where the two are growing together, and it's, it's quite a bit, it's like almost half again, maybe like a third less tall, and the inflorescence is smaller, the glooms are smaller, so there's, there's definitely morphological characters, um, what's going on there, whether it's a gradient where you draw the line, um, I'm not the person to, to answer that question. By the way, if there's you know, any questions or anything, I guess we can just, you know, we can uh, save them to the end, or you can ask now, and if I don't have the answer, there's plenty of other people here who, between us, who probably grow. Uh, so this one is an interesting story, and uh, I apologize for the quality of the photos, but you'll, 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 you'll see why in the next photo. Uh, so this is the white camas lily, or some people call it the, the death camas. I try not to use that name because it's, you know, it's hard to get support for, for rare plants when you're going on the call something death camas. It's like, why do you want to protect that? You know? <laughs> anyway, uh, so white camas from here on in. And this is an interesting story. It was known uh, historically uh, from a collection on Lake Champlain from 1912, and that was the last time anybody had ever reported it, had ever seen it, and all it said was headlands of Lake Champlain. So that narrowed it down quite a bit. I mean, we only had like 90 miles of lake to look for. Uh, so in 2010, uh, this was one of the more ex exciting days of my career, um, Art Gilman and I get uh, an email of, of, of a photo of this from an amateur, um, nurseryman, uh, an amateur botanist, he's a professional nurseryman, excuse me, an amateur botanist, and he sends us his picture, and he says, so I was paddling along Lake Champlain, and I saw this on, on a ledge, I had no idea what it was, but I know for sure I've never seen it before in my life. So, you know, I looked at this, and I, I emailed Art, and I said, Art, do you, do you think that's, do we, you know, do we agree this is what it is? And it was like, yeah, so we went out and confirmed it, and it's, it's out there, and it's been there, it was like about well, 98 years, um, and it, it seems to be doing fine. Was, was that uh, formerly Zygodinus? Yes, it was like, Zygodinus was the genus. Yeah. Yeah. And um, this is why the, the quality of the photos was so bad. Uh, we were, were collecting seeds for um, New England Wildflower Society, uh, now the Native <laughs> Plant Trust. <laughs> Thank wow. you. So these are about 40 foot legends, you can see. That's where, that's where it grows. So when I took those pictures, 
I was like hanging over the top of that ledge, hanging onto a cedar tree, hoping it was, you know, I made sure it was rooted pretty well, kind of with my, my phone over the edge taking a picture. So yeah, that's why it wasn't in focus. So, so we got a number of seeds. Uh, that's, uh, I think, Bob Zeno who works in our program. And then uh, Artemisia campestris, uh, the subspecies canadensis. So this is um, this is like rare throughout the Northeast. It gets more uh, like a little more common up in Canada, but you'll notice it's still uh, a category two uh, for the NALC. So it it's certainly doesn't get that that common. Uh, and it's a NEPCOP. That's New England Plant Conservation Program Division Two, so that means it's real throughout New England, and most of these are going to be that. So um, this photo was taken on uh, on uh, Mount uh, Pisgah in, uh, up in uh, Westmore, and that's Lake Willoughby down below. Um, and this is like the probably the premier ice climbing place in the Northeast, and the reason for that is there's all this seepage coming down and of course it's carbon it's the calcareous bedrock so that's why all the plants are there but the, um, all the seepage freezes in the winter and forms these huge ice falls and, and, and water, frozen waterfalls and the ice climbers come from like all over the northeast to, to climb on it um, presumably they're not doing any damage because everything's under ice um, i think probably can't see that but there's a little blue dot down there i think that's al Ashuri actually <laughs> she, uh, she and I and uh, Joey and Hoy were up that day collecting seeds for uh, the Milan Flower Society. Is that the only safe part of the uh, No, there's a, uh, there's a couple of, of sites for it. So then the, the Canadian uh, milk fetch. This is a stragulus canadensis. So you'll see uh, this is a division two in NEPCOP, so it's rare in New England, but it doesn't have a, um, an NALCC regional rank. So it gets more common uh, in, in New York and, and farther north. Uh, this is a, a cobble shore specialist, so it grows on the uh, rocky shores primarily of the Champlain Islands. There's a few sites on the mainland, but most of the, the uh, larger populations are out on some, most of the some of the smaller islands. It goes, as I said, right around the cobble. Um, so this is some of our rare vitriciums. We have the, um, to the left is the, uh, the upswept moonwort, which is uh, disjunct from western mountains. And it's, I think it's like S1 in Minnesota, uh, Ontario, and Quebec. And it just it skips New York. It, Michigan, all those other states in between. We just have this one population in Vermont. So you see, that's a, a um, that's a category uh, one for the NALCC. By the way, the categories. Maybe I didn't. I'm sorry, I didn't explain this. Uh, R one is critically imperiled. Uh, R two is imperiled, and R three is vulnerable. And if it doesn't have an R rank, then it's none of the above. Um, the next one is. Um, Prairie, prairie uh, moonwort, and that's as you would infer from the name, is disjunct from um, prairies and, uh, and sand dunes and such, um, mostly in the Midwest. But it's uh, on calcareous substrate, even out there. So I don't know if um, there's sand dunes that are actually calcareous. I, I've seen northern white cedar growing on sand dunes. It's, it's, yeah, it's, I kind of scratched my head when I saw that out in, uh, that out in uh, Wisconsin. And then the last one is the spatulate um, moonwort, which, um, so if you notice, all of these are, are regional ones, so they're all critically in peril in, in our region. Um, they G3, so they're rare throughout the country. Uh, this one is, occurs along, um, the St. Lawrence Valley in Quebec, and then along the, uh, I think, the northern shore of like the Great Lakes in Canada, and again, farther, farther out west. And all three of these are like in one, like really pr close proximity to one another on this uh, kind of limestone cliff. And uh, 
how they got there, um, it's, it's, you got to wonder. Um, I mean, I know spores get up in the air column and go a long way, but I'm kind of interested. And, oh, that's the other story I wanted to tell. So all of these, I think the two of these were discovered in like 19, uh, 2010, and one of them in like 2015. So all three of these were first discovered in Vermont in the last 10 years. And at least two of them, and maybe all three of them, uh, aren't correct me if I'm wrong, was found by this uh, amateur uh, 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 fern fancier. Uh, he's a retired physics teacher from New Jersey, of all places, sorry. <laughs> and he moved to Vermont, and he just, he just goes out, that's what he, he does in his spare time, is he goes out and looks at ferns. And he found all three of these, and, uh, or at least two of them. Did he find the all three? Three. All three. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's amazing. Um, you know, every wow. state should have somebody like him. His name is Mike Rosenthal. So we'll lend him to you if you really <laughs> ask nicely. Uh, but more about him later. Uh, so this is gray humulus. It's a, a small uh, mustard. And this Vermont has two populations, and they are the only populations uh, in, in the Northeast in the U.S. Wow. So it gets up into... Uh, Quebec and Nova Scotia, and then it's more common out west, as you see from the, the G5 rank. Um, whoops. See what I'm doing here. Um, so that, that, again, there's a population of this on, uh, on Pisgah, where, where it goes on these seeping wet cliffs. This one, uh, I stuck in here because we presumably have the only populations in, in New England, but I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty common where it occurs, so I'm, I'm just thinking it's just kind of under, under, um, under inventory in other, other states. It's, um, some people put it under Sylvaticum. I think Arthur Haynes does. He's a Palestasia Sylvaticum subspecies for Um But, and you see the NALCC rank is uh, NR, so there's a certain amount of uncertainty there. People aren't quite sure of the taxonomy. But what's distinctive about it is um, the sinus in the leaves. It's, it's like this uh, kind of rectangular um, sinus. And the others are kind of more rounded, uh, the other subspecies. But what's, what's really distinctive, and it's not 100%, is you get um, two, two flowers in, in an axle some of the time. All of the other subspecies, you only get one. So if you, if you get that, you can be pretty certain of it. You see the one on the left, there's only one there, so it doesn't do it all the time. And, you know, is this a good subspecies? I mean, I'm not qualified to answer that, but um, as of now, um, Art Gilman and Art, Arthur Haynes both have it in their books under, well, under different species, but uh, so. uh, This is um, prairie red root, and you see the, the, the Ghostbusters photo down the lower <laughs> right. <coughs> So this plant, uh, we have one population in Vermont, and it's, again, the only population in, in New England. Uh, it, it's, it, it's still rare in, in New York uh, and Quebec, but then, it, judging by its name, prairie redwood, it, it does get common, more common in, in the Midwest, and you see that from the G5 ranking, and it is a, a, a regional rank of one for the NALCC. So uh, how this is distinguished from the common um, New Jersey tea, uh, the, the leaves are, are narrower, they're not quite as broad or egg-shaped, but also the flowers are terminal rather than axillary. So what we're doing here, the population, uh, the natural population occurs along the uh, Burlington waterfront, and it's, it's kind of being impacted somewhat. It was being overgrown, and it wasn't ever flowering and producing fruit. So we got the bright idea, well, let's uh, it's on city park land. Let's go out and clear some trees and open up the canopy. And so the plants started flowering more, but what also happened is all the invasives came in, so the mm. poison ivy and there's, there's rubus all over it, and it's just like a total mess, and it's getting overgrown. So we kind of got a little worried, and um, we took some, we made a withdrawal from the uh, NEPCOP, or uh, New England Waterflower Society Seed Bank, and actually grew some plants from, um, from those seeds and established a new population in Colchester, Vermont, which is where it is, it's known historically, so it's, it's still within a historic range. And we put it out at Camp Johnson, which is a military uh, 
uh, base that's on protected land. And we put, um, we put nine plants out there. Um, we germinated a bunch of seeds and they only got nine. And as of this year, they've been out for about three years now, uh, we have five that are still alive. So we're reasonably happy with that. Uh, just as an aside, um, this is, by the way, that some of, most of you know, or some of you know, and that's Bill Brumbach. Um, that's me there and two people from Burlington Parks and Rec. Uh, I'll tell you about that in a second. But Bill was like, oh, we can take cuttings from this. It'll be great. And no reflection on Bill, but none of the cuttings survived. Like, I don't know what we're doing wrong, but we can't get this to go from cuttings. So we, we showed up to, to repair, we put a fence around it because animals were getting in and, and uh, burgering the plants and stuff. And uh, we're going to clear the place now. Yeah. So Bill and I show up, and these Burlington Parks and Rec people show up, and they pull out their white suits. And we, <laughs> I said, wow, you know, can I have one of those? And they said, yeah. So they're, so they're like painter suits. And of course, the poison ivy was miserable. I get poison ivy real bad. So it's great. I, I highly recommend painted uh, suits. Is that like a tie no, no, it's, it's, I mean, Tyvek's you roast, but yeah. these, are, these are green, you can, I mean, you can almost kind of see right through them, you can yeah. see, they're, they're like paper, so they tear really easy, so that's the problem, you can, I wouldn't go through any thorns with them, but, you know, if, if sure beats getting poison ivy. Yeah. So, I, so I do have a quick story, so I wanted to look for that plant, and I said, Deb, we have to walk to look for it, go to bike path, and she said, no, we're going to bike path. Oh. So anyways, we went biking in the Burlington bike path, and Deb saw blooming. This is in mid oh. So she rediscovered that population, oh. which is kind of cool. Oh. How long ago was that? And then I ended up getting credit for it in our database, and she never looked. <laughs> 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 yeah. How long ago was that? Too? That was in the 80s. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe 89, yeah. 87, 88. Uh, this is uh, a golden... Golden Carillus, yeah, right, same, it's a genus, thank you. Um, oops. So uh, you see one yellow flower there. Yeah. Um, it's, a, it's a limestone rock outcrop thing, and it's very short life, it's maybe two years if it persists. But the thing that's interesting, and um, this is a site that's owned by the Lake Champlain Land Trust. And you can't really see, well, you can see it down here. Somebody, probably a bunch of kids, I mean, that went in, probably had a campfire, and got away, and there was like a, a, maybe a couple acre wildfire. Mm -hmm. And I guess uh, Kate Cruz, who's here, told us about it. She like, sent us an email and said, so I went out to the, the Eagle Mountain site, and there's corridalists all over the place. You know, normally you get like half a dozen plants. So there were just hundreds and hundreds of plants. This, this species just loves fire. at sea banks. It's students as a fire. So whoever those kids are, you know, I want to thank them. Whoever they do some more Austin days. Yeah. 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 You think it was lightning? I think that's what the. Um, yeah, I now follow forest fires in the newspapers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So this is another mustard, this, this Karenia, and uh, we have two sites for it. Uh, both of them on islands in Lake Champlain. Mm -hmm. It's a, a western species, but it's um, again, it's I guess it's some taxonomic issues because it's 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 in art, so it's not uncertain in the ranks. But it's um, it's rare throughout the um, I think it's rare in New York and it's also rare in Quebec and it gets more common out in, out in the Midwest. It's more of a prairie species, uh, but it's very. Um, it senesces really early by if you go, once it, the seeds mature by I mean, I think by J July, even early July, it's it's like gone. It's completely brown and withered. Um, this is uh, green violet, so it's actually in the violet family, but the, the flowers are very 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 different. You can't um, you can't really see them. They're buried down in the axils, and they're just tiny. These little green flowers. Get up and look real close. But these are the seed pods. I was out collecting seeds from Nepcot. We have one population in Vermont, which is about maybe 100 yards from Lake Champlain. And you can't get much farther west than that. Leaving Vermont. Um, but it gets quite common uh, once you cross the lake. I think it's like S4 in New York State. So again, mm -hmm. just, just barely gets in. 
And this is where it's growing. It's on this kind of um, scree slope. And so collecting seeds is kind of treacherous because you, you, I, I, I'm always afraid of like triggering a, a landslide because you get out there and the whole thing just starts sliding. And, um, concerned about my safety, but I'm also concerned about taking out a bunch of plants. You know, this is whole, the whole bit set from crashing down on it. So it's a little, a little fancy getting out there. But it's, it, yeah, it's just kind of an odd plant. You can just look at those, that seed pod, it looks like a pea pod. It's, uh, so this is another story. So I mentioned that fellow, uh, Mike Rosenthal, um, the retired uh, physics teacher. This is a new species. Uh, that was first described in about 2010, I think. So he was out looking at isoedes. I mean, you know, what else would you do when you retire? <laughs> 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 isoedes. I mean, somebody's got to do it, right? So this guy decided to do it. So he was looking in this, whoops, this high elevation pond in the, um, in the Green Mountains, you know, oligotrophic, and he found this weird isoedes, and he tried um, King it out, and he couldn't, and he couldn't, and um, he sent it to um, what's his name, uh, Taylor, Carl Taylor. Carl Taylor, and Carl Taylor looked at. He's the expert on isoedes in, um, in the country of the world. I don't know, and he said, you know, I think this is a new species. Why don't you, you know, take <coughs> take pictures of it and submit it and write it up, and yeah. So now it's named, and he named it isoedes through Montana. And the middle picture is one I took. Um, and that's it growing on the bottom uh, in about two feet of water. So that's how clear the water is, and it's really oligotrophic. It just grows over along the shoreline, mostly like the southern half of the pond. Um, so pretty slick. And he's, he's looked in other ponds and hasn't found it. So it's not like this is something that's just overlooked. Um, again, with the caveat that there's not a lot of us going out there and, and looking at isoedes, but um, he's, he's looked at a fair number of Certainly not ubiquitous by any means. Uh, so this um, is the pale vetchling, uh, the lathrus, and I'm not sure why this is uncertain. Um, it's, it's curious. I don't remember. I was involved with that, but I don't remember why this came out. It's, I think it's, I mean, it's certainly rare in New England. Maybe it's certainly in other parts of the country. Uh, and this is more. Well, I mean, this grows, I've seen it in like limestone cedar bluffs, but it also occurs um, on, on sort of the edge of cobble shores on, on some of the Lake Champlain Islands. Mm -hmm. So, and then um, this is one of our uh, endemics in the Northeast, the uh, Marcescent or Serpentine Sandbor. And we have one population of it in Vermont growing on serpentine. And then um, it's, it's endemic to Vermont, Quebec, and um, Nova Scotia. And that's its entire distribution. I guess this, that there was some thought that it might be related to Western species, but I think it's pretty much decided it's a, a separate species. Um, so this is uh, region two. Um, and what, what's neat about it, it kind of, um, you can see the rock there, and it just kind of hangs over the rock like that. Uh, and it's the, I had to look this up so that uh, one of the common names is Marcescent Sandborn. So I, I had it's like Marcescent, I wasn't sure what that meant. So anyway, it's think of like um, a beach or a, uh, an oak. It's like the, the, the leaves kind of turn brown and wither, but they stay attached. Mm -hmm. So you notice all the dead leaves there. It just kind of loses its leaves, but I mean, the, brown, the leaves senesce, but they, they hang on to the plant. So my current that this is one of our more unaccessible sites. I mean, it's more largely rock climbing. Too. Yeah, um, I census this once, um, the, the full population, uh, with an experienced rock climber. And he kind of talked me up and, and down and got me where I needed to go. I mean, it's not, it's not a place you want to go by yourself. <laughs> you don't want to go on a, a rainy day when the rocks are wet. Uh, this is one of the rarest willows in New England, a uh, peach leaf willow. And it just gets into Vermont in like, um, I guess it's like two places on either side of the um, bridge going out to, um, um, was it North York? 
No, Auburn, excuse me. Um, Mercury. Yeah, and um, this gets more common in New York. I'm surprised it's at Division Two because uh, maybe it's Western New York where it gets more abundant. But it, it, it looks, I guess the thing to me it's closest to would be uh, Black Willow, Salix Nigra. Um, it's obviously a smaller tree. It only gets maybe like 30, 35 feet, but it, you know, Black Willow stuff out that, that, that size too. But what's, what's I, I, the most distinctive character is um, it's much paler on the underside, whereas Black Willow is, is more uniform on the, on the, um, the top side of the leaf and the underside. And Black Willow also has those uh, glands at the tip of the, uh, at the top of the petiole where each of the leaf blade, and this, this does not. But um, yeah, superficially, they're, they're hard to distinguish. I'm scratching my head over my head. And you notice it's, excuse me, it's uniformly serrated. It's in that, in that group, which, you know. So this is the um, yellow um, saxifrage. And you, you see it in the flower uh, to the left. This is, this is rare um, throughout the Northeast. It's rare, I think. I'm, I'm pretty sure the only sites for this in the Northeast are in Vermont and New York. It doesn't get yeah, into, sure. but it doesn't get into. In um, I think it's historic. It's not extant there. Um, and then it's more common out west which is why it's a G5, but it doesn't get up into Canada. So this is it for like the, the Northeast. And it has this, that really neat um, growth form, just like the um, incessant sandboard, where it kind of, I mean, it's, it's rooted up here, and it just, it's just kind of hanging over the edge of the cliff. And the water's like dripping down underneath it. It's just like, oh, this secret, it's, it's like, it's really neat. It's like this hang, miniature hanging garden. Um, it's amazing. It's hanging and it doesn't just slough off. I think that picture is taken on uh, Pisgah as well. Uh, and this is the uh, purple mountain sex trench, positive folia. Um, I don't have it in flower, but you see that on the left is the, um, the seed heads and on the right is, is the plant. And this too, uh, it, gets into, it gets into New York and it, it does actually get up into back to <coughs> maybe uh, Nova Scotia as well. Um, this is one that I think Art found this one in, in, in Vermont, um, the Ontario uh, Aster. It's, um, it's just on uh, some of the Lake Champlain Islands. Is that is it more extensive than that? Or? Well, it was first uh, collected in Vermont by Peter Zika. Uh -huh. oh. And so I was following up on an repairing label that he had uh -huh. and, uh, did he, did he the, identify it as something else? He identified it as, uh, as a simply a form, uh -huh. which is similar to Yeah. But um, it's kind of the upper limit of floodplain forests. <laughs> uh, so, but only on the Champlain Islands, right? Well, it? well, I thought it was Harrisburg. Okay, so uh, it is on the main the, island, too. The forecast in the state park, the whole okay. lot's there. Yeah. And then we also saw it last year. <laughs> Auburn. 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 Oh, right. Auburn. And Northwark. 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 Uh, so this is, a, this is another odd one. It's um, a cork or rock elm, mm. and it's, um, you can see it's like really, really distinctive. When, when that, not all the trees have that corky winged twigs. It's uh, mostly like the two and three year old branches that have it. Um, you, you see it gets to be a very big tree. I mean, it gets, it's up to, that's about a 50 foot tall Maybe sixty foot tall tree, so it's um, it's it's as big as uh, American elm. This occurs. We've got about 
four populations from it all in Western Vermont on these uh, kind of limey uh, cobbles. It's just rocky cobbles and it just loves the, the limestone. Um, it's, it can be tricky to distinguish um, from slippery elm if it doesn't have the real distinct corky branches. And that seems to vary with the populations. There's some other ways that the fruit is distinctive, so you get it in fruit. And the thing you've got to be careful of, somebody ticked me off to a population and, uh, down in Benson, and I drove down and looked at it, and there was like this nice stand of, and I'm like, wow, this is, this is great. And it was a little suspicious because this is not cloning. And the, um, there's an English cork elm, which is a horticultural escape, and that's cloned with this, this, like this bent club, and I was like, hmm. But I, I looked, and there were some seeds, like way up. Of course, I couldn't reach them. I didn't have pole pruners. So I drove my, my truck underneath the tree and stood on the roof, and I'm just able with a, I think I had a soil auger. I was able to pull down the branch and get some of the, the uh, fruits, and sure enough, it was the almost Procera, which is the English cork elm. So if you see these corky branches, it's, it's not a slam dunk. You've got to look at, you know, it's clonal, you should be really suspicious, but you really need to look at the, at the seeds. Um, the seeds on, on this, are, are the cork elm are really hairy. So the face of the seed is hairy, and it's got like a hairy fringe around it as, as well. The, uh, English elm. There's a report of that from Meredith in New Hampshire, but it just says the edge of the field. Mm -hmm. I'll bet it's the English uh, cork elm. That's, that's pretty though. suspicious. Yeah, I mean, um, that's so far disjunct. We don't have any on the east. I'm sorry? This was a very old report from Meredith. Wow. Well, maybe we're, we're about checking out, except but, it's a pretty big location. Yeah. How many fields are there in Meredith? <laughs> <laughs> so now I'm going to. Um, Kind of change gears a little bit. There's some, these are plants that also occur elsewhere in New England, so I apologize for that. But these are some Vermont specialties. There's only a few of them. I, I felt like I'd be remiss if I didn't touch on these. So this is the Green Mountain Maiden here that was first described in Vermont by a, uh, a grad student at UVM, Kathy Paris. Um, and it's a serpentine obligate. We have about five or six populations, uh, I think about six now. And we were the, it was like the only place it was known to occur. And then they started checking the serpentine belt up in Quebec, and they started finding more and more of it. So this is like a, I think we have it as maybe S1, S2 in, in Vermont, but it's S3 in Quebec. So they, they were finding a lot of it, and I guess it gets up into, maybe up into uh, Nova Scotia as well. But I think they recently found one population, or maybe two art in Maine, or <laughs> New one last year, yeah. But there's another one, another one that was in the so, Isle, one from the, the So you got like two? Two, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So on serpentine ice. Yeah, correct. Yeah, yeah. Right. So this is, um, the, the uh, pinnules are more triangular than, than the uh, pedatum, but it gets really tricky because we also have a ludicum, um, with the western uh, serpentine uh, maybe here. And it's, it's distinguishing between the two can be, can be really tricky. Uh, I usually have art look at them or, or, or Don Avery or somebody who, who spends a lot more time with them than I do. And it, grows, it has different growth forms depending if it's in the sun or in the shade. So it has this really upright form if it's in the sun or in the shade. It's kind of relaxed. Uh, this is one of our other specialties. It's, uh, this is the Jessup's Milk Fetch. So there's a, it's a variety of um, Ravinsia, and uh, there's only three places in the world it grows, and mm -hmm. one is uh, one on the Vermont side, and two on the in New Hampshire. So actually, New Hampshire has more pepper than we do uh, on the Connecticut River. And so that's the plant in flower on the upper left, and the habitat is in the middle. So these rocky outcrops. Some of these are like at 45 degree angles, so it's covered with poison ivy, so that's, that's where the painted suits are going to come in handy. <laughs> Can you tell us about the natural processes? Yeah, yeah what so, is it? so I went, yeah, what's, um, so this plant, this is a small plant, it's only about four or five inches, but you see it's like just anchored into the a crack in the bedrock. So uh, this is apparently 
it's dependent on flooding and ice scour. So when the when the floods come by, uh, everything gets inundated. And as long as it has that, it has its long tap root and it's down into the cracks. It's just like it hangs on for dear life. And it apparently, you know, it, what it can't handle is sustained flooding. So if the Connecticut River is up, uh, if it's inundated for like a more than a few days during the growing season, that's generally not a good thing. And we notice pretty heavy mortality. And then the same with when the ice comes through. I've seen on these ledges up here in that, that middle picture, I've seen um, I've seen refrigerator sized ice blocks like mm. up on the tree line. It's, it's just amazing. It just comes through you know, when, the, when the river lets loose and it just kind of rips everything out of, out of the way. Um, and that's why there's no trees or anything there. Anything, anything that's standing in the winter gets gets taken out. Of course, now it's there's dam influence on, on the river, so we don't know what, how that's working with the hydrology. We've, um, because this is federally endangered and there's only three populations, we're trying to establish a new population zone. And we've had limited success with, with one site so far. Uh, upstream, uh, so these are all below Wilder Dam. Those would be the one with, with Wilder Dam. Population that we established is upstream of that, with the idea that if there's a catastrophic event, you know, like a big flood below while the dam, it wouldn't take out that population would be affected by that. So we're trying to, to kind of hedge our bets, if you will. Um, we're also trying to introduce additional populations, and those are um, kind of up in the air. Uh, we put out plants this year at like three or four sites, and um, we went back, and there was like big flood in. Uh, we put the plants out the second week of May, and back two weeks later, and there was 50% mortality. Mm -hmm. And normally, this we have 100% survival, but there was a, a flood, and the plants were inundated. When this, we put out seedlings, the seedlings don't have that tap root yet. Mm -hmm. So if they get in, if they get a flood, they just they're gone. All the mature plants at all the sites that were flooded were just fine. It doesn't bother them. Um, yeah, it's um, it's a tough one. But hopefully, we have the fourth site. So this is the other variety of um, Astragalus rudensiae, this is variety minor, the alpine milkfetch. Um, so this also occurs in Maine, I believe. Um, but it's uh, it's similar, I mean, it grows on rock outcrops only in alpine areas and instead of um, in, 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 instead of river shores. And it's more of a calcifier. Uh, rudensiae, Giuseppe, I rather, we've had the rock analyzed and it's only very slightly carbonate. And, you know, this goes all over the place at like Mount Pisco, which is, it gets that calcareous secret. So there's definitely uh, just an more of an affinity for calcium with this variety than the other one. Uh, this is a uh, smooth draper, uh, a little diminutive mustard that was previously known only from Vermont, but I think recently, I think maybe Arthur Haynes found a population, maybe just one population in, in Maine. Um, and you see it on the upper left uh, in flower. And it, it's a real, um, its habitat, its real strict habitat, at least in Vermont, is uh, these uh, limestone cedar bluffs. So you see it's, it's almost always growing under cedar, and it's about anywhere from foot to maybe five feet back from the edge of the bluff. So it just gets a, a little bit of light. And it's, most of it is basal rosettes. And the basal rosettes, you can't really see this. Um, you have to take my word for it. But this, um, there's stellate hairs on it. And um, uh, Draper arabicans also has stellate hairs, but these stellate hairs are slightly stalked. So there's a stalk that comes up for the stellate hair. You gotta look at it really close in really good light, but you, you can actually see that. Um, Arabicans, it's the, the stellate has a sussel. Yes, you see the, the seeds there. I think this is, um, what do you think? I think all of our sites are on the Champlain Island. So, um, do you know anything about, does anyone know anything about the main? From Mount Cameo, on Moose Head Lake. Is that mm -hmm. blind? It's, yeah, it's blind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, 
Is it on the edge of a bluff? Kind of it's pretty rich. I mean, there's other calcifiles. Yeah, so okay, so it must be. I remember it was like person, but yeah. Okay. Yeah, so it sounds like the habitat's similar with only yeah. a moose head lake instead of like Champlain. Um, spacing out on the common name for this. Um, something like that. Um, it's, it's in the Asta family. It's, um, we have two sites for this. I think it's, um, it occurs in, in Connecticut. I think it's um, obviously not terribly common down there because it's still Division II. But the, the, uh, the thing about this is the, the flower heads are really kind of sticky. It's res really resinous. It's like some of the, um, some of the composites that you see out west in the, in the desert that have that really resinous, sticky fluorescence. And it, it grows right out on, on limestone outcrops in the, in the Champlain Valley. And I think, yeah, we just have the two populations. This is, um, oh, we're getting the common name of this one. Yellow Pimpernel. Yellow Pimpernel, thank you. Yeah. Uh, so this is in the APAC uh, League and the Parsley family. And it's another, um, some of the most, I guess a lot of the populations are on limestone cedar bluffs. So it's, again, it's a, um, a bluff species. And um, yeah, it's, uh, I think it's maybe like, it also occurs in, in Connecticut. I don't know if it gets into, does it get into Western Mass, Bob, or Paul? I haven't seen it, I don't know. I yeah, and maybe it skips, it may skip Madison, because I know it's in Connecticut. Yeah. I know from Wisconsin, but I haven't seen it here. <laughs> and that's um, monitoring boots rattlesnake root on Mount Mansfield. Um, I think Everett, you were with me. I think maybe you took that picture, and that's before you held up my foot when I I peered over the edge with binoculars trying to, because the boots rattlesnake like, occurs on these cracks in the rock. That, that's like a, maybe a 200 foot cliff or something. And um, you, obviously we can't get down there, so we try to peer out of the camp. That's trust. <laughs> and this is one of our forays up uh, Smuggler's Notch. And um, that's, let me, think, let me see, Scott Bailey, Charlie Cogbill. And George Springsteen is a local geologist. Um, and that's Brett Angstrom, who led the trip today. And I think that's me, scrambling back. And we just had this great foray up there. And I'm going to end with a good message for all of us there. We had somebody take that picture when we came across that sign. So. Anyway, that will do it. Thank you.
Are the dam owners, like Great River Hydro, helping with that effort at all? Or? Um, not, not so much. They haven't helped yeah. financially. Yeah. <laughs> they claim, you know, the relicensing, they, they surveyed it, and they claim it's not being influenced by the dam. Mm -hmm. uh, which, you know, maybe directly it's not, but they're holding water back, so when a, a natural rainstorm occurs, more water maybe comes through than the there were no dam there, and it's 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 not, you know, um, I think the flooding is maybe more severe, but maybe less frequent. Mm -hmm. they, they've changed the periodicity of it, for sure. Yeah, I mean, some of these seem to be doing okay in the short term, but I think that, you know, gradually, you know, most times we see populations like slowly going down. I'm, I'm generally happy if, if it's status quo. Mm -hmm. I mean, rarely do you see things in Sometimes you do, like like the pale caridlas. You know, we just need more fires. Right? <laughs> It'll be everywhere. <laughs> so two of those last two species you showed, the uh, leafy cup and the unpimpernel, in the Midwest expand dramatically with fire. Uh -huh. um, so uh, the I leaf cup and like several of the others. You know, like those two come to mind because they were just yeah. the end there. Um, the yellow pimpernel is in you know, good quality prairies in both sides. That I've seen it radically expand. And we had one hillside with the leafy cup. We did a controlled burn through there and it almost became weedy. It became so dense wow. that it was almost like blocking out other plants. Wow. We, you know, one of our sites for the leaf cup is, is pretty small and discreet, but the other one is, is really big and it's, it's really um, you know, widespread. And it's, it's on this like, rocky cliff and I think maybe there's enough rock slides so there's no fires but I think that's kind of like you know clearing the ground and creating disturbance that yeah. it, it just kind of perpetuates itself. That would be my guess. Yeah. You seem to have a number of disjuncts. Uh, do you think that some of your rarities are doing part because of the distribution of glacial refugia? Uh, there was no we were completely glitched. Yeah, but yeah, like but, uh, mountain out there, you mean, uh, and uh, yeah. off the coast of Maine. I don't know. There just seems to be a number in the area, and then also um, this is the Charlotte whale. Yeah, and sort of oddball things Charlotte. are going on. Charlotte. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, maybe this is going off on a tangent, but at that same conference, I just found out there were like four native earthworm species in Vermont. So where, where did they hang out during the glacier? I mean, were they buried under the ice? I mean, did, were there eggs that survived? Or were there some refugia somewhere that these native earthworms were able to persist? So, yeah. yeah maybe some of the disjuncts and the earthworms kind of hung out together. Yeah. <laughs> the Mount Albert glacial refugia is, is a misnomer, isn't that correct? I, I don't think that's correct. Um, I, think, I think that was in literature and it was proven incorrect. Yeah. Yeah. I have a more uh, multi-part question about the classifications for NEPCOM. So, could you clarify the difference between NEPCOM one and two, which a lot of yours were? Okay. I couldn't exactly find a pattern except the so Okay. Yeah. And yeah. then the second part is like, does that really help you, or do you agree or disagree with those two divisions, or? Um, the, the so along those lines. Yeah, uh, yeah so the, the New England Plain Conservation Program um, divisions, I'm sorry I didn't explain that, I guess I could be at NALCC. So Division 1 is globally rare, so anything that's G1 through G3 is a Division 1. Yeah. Division 2 means it's rare throughout New England. So it could be a G5, but it's rare in New England. So most yeah. of these plants were at least Division 2. It did seem to follow a pattern, but the, the Metcalf ones, some of them were widespread in New England. You are saying they would be, it seemed like there were a couple of ones that you said were found throughout New England. No? I don't think so. Okay. And then there's a Division 3, which is um, disjunct in New England. So it has to be like at least 50 or 100 miles from the next nearest population. So like um, my Pensia maybe in, in Vermont is a Division Three because it's it's more common in the White Mountains, but our population is far enough away. And then there's a Division Four, which is historic in New England. So no no extant populations are known. And then there's a Division IND, 
which is like, we don't really know. I mean, there may be taxonomic confusion and things that maybe will split, etc. cetera. They're largely fifth year view of the plants and then... Yeah, I mean, I think a, a number of us here were involved with it. I know, I think Art had some input and I did. And, um, where's Paul? Yeah. Paul, you were involved in, in at least the first iteration of it. We were on the second iteration now. We went and we did it again. And actually, we, the number of indeterminates, INDs, declined. So we didn't resolve some of them. In 2012? Yes. And the decline was due to the really extraordinary efforts that Arthur Haynes did. Right, the right. Down the mm -hmm. However, that was funded then. Yeah, I think they got a grant for it. It's similar to Massachusetts. So you, you can't take an endangered plant without a uh, permit from the Secretary of Natural Resources, even if it's on your property. Yep. So I know, like New Hampshire, you can't take it without permission of the landowner. So if you're the landowner, you can give yourself permission. Yeah. Yeah. But here it doesn't matter. You, you can't take it at all without a permit. So yeah. And um, we now have the ability to protect um, Necessary habitat, critical, critical habitat. So, but we have to we have to legally designate that, and it's it's pretty uh, labor intensive. So we haven't done that yet for any plants, and I think we're going to do a few animals maybe to just kind of start going down that road. So even though you know it's, it's not necessarily um, like now we can we can only protect with the, the, the habitat that's occupied by the plants, but if we designate a critical habitat. We can encompass it broadly. And, and I think at the federal level, there's only critical habitat designation for animals and not well, for plants. Is that no correct? protection for plants. So a federally endangered plant is not protected federally unless it's on federal land or there's federal funds involved. Mm -hmm. So if it's a federally listed plant on private property and there's no federal funds involved, it doesn't matter. We had a taking of. Um, Northeast Bullrush, they're essentially to feed us. And it was on a power company property, private property, and um, a bunch of the plants got whacked. And I called up U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and spoke to somebody in Concord. And he says, so why are you calling me? <laughs> I said, well, I know you have no jurisdiction, but I thought it's federally endangered. You'd have some, you'd want to know. And he goes, oh, OK, well, thanks. <laughs> and I'm just like, there's a real double standard between plants and animals. As far as yeah, so you have more, more than two federal lists. Um, just those two. We have ISOCHU is listed, but it's um, considered expert. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We still look for it once in a while. <laughs>